Well, thank you very much, Christina, for that uh, kind introduction. And it's been my pleasure as well to work with you. <laughs> it's uh, not rare, uh, not, it must be very rare, I think, that, that you are, are aware that Christina will soon be the president of the Electrochemical Society. And with this team, which was uh, included David Hall, uh, was Baron McDougall. So I have the pleasure of publishing papers with two presidents of the Electrochemical <laughs> Society. So thank you uh, for that pleasure too. <laughs> it's, it's uh, uh, as uh, Christina said, a long career, especially with ECS now. And I feel greatly honored for the work that I'm going to talk about to be uh, awarded this prize. And I should emphasize right at the start that it's a work of lots of people. I published papers uh, with over a hundred members of the National Research Council. It's a team effort all the way. So I'll highlight a few names, but we should always remember that this work is a result of a long-term research program at the National Research Council. So uh, in this talk, I will mention uh, first in the introduction the reasons why we've done it and then spend the major part of the talk uh, giving you details about what we've done. Some of it may be too technical for you um, and I'm sorry for that if it happens but it'll give you a flavor for what's going on and where we're heading to and then I'll make some brief conclusions. Oh, let's try it this way. It's the other one. It's the other one. Oh, it's the down one. Yes. Thank you. So um, here we have the outline of my talk. And first, why are we interested in CMOS compatible light emitters? You all use CMOS, it's in your pockets. <laughs> and you're using light all the time, but you don't realize that microwaves are light. As you're communicating by microwaves all the time. But uh, the electronics that's in your pocket is all silicon based. That's the key factor here. And the problem with silicon is that it has an indirect bank up. And I'll explain to you what that means later. Um, and the, the whole purpose of my work is how to overcome that restriction. And it's a severe restriction, as you'll see. And our approach has been, as uh, Christine uh, said in the uh, introduction, using lower dimensional materials. So, and focus primarily on silicon and germanium. And then in the course of that review, I'll cover both theory, the fabrication of the materials, and their light emitting properties. So this is my first uh, slide to emphasize two points. One is that the last century was the age of electronics. We all know electronics. And very early in that century, there was an overload of information. Look at all these telephone lines in New York City around 1920. Just incredible density of wires. And look at all the people that were required to switch between the different wires so you could talk on your iPhone. <laughs> well, of course, eventually some of these wires got buried in the ground. But copper wires were still in use until fiber optics came along and relieved the whole problem. And from the point of view of dealing with the, oops, I've uh, hit something wrong there. There we go. Oh, <laughs> uh, I just hit the wrong button by accident. Uh, so uh, fiber optics came along and relieved the density problem. Now we can send information all over the world, no problem at all. And uh, these little ladies were eventually replaced by mechanical devices, stepper motor switches, and eventually by electronics too. However, 
there's still a problem and, and uh, that is too much information. So this is the core of the, the problem. As we know, electronics is still important in, in industry and devices are getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster, which has led to Moore's law, which I wanted to mention for sure. And in the meantime, this uh, speeding up and so on and complexity has got to the point that we can't push electrons down copper wires anymore fast enough to actually do the job we want to do. So there's a pressing need which has started uh, uh, 30 to 40 years ago to merge silicon el electronics with particles of light, photons which we now call photonics. And uh, this is being done. It's not, not new now, uh, but it, it requires the use of three, five compounds to produce the light, the lasers, we need to put down the fibers. And this uh, is not an easy thing to do from a com construction point of view. What is required is something compatible with conventional electronics. But nevertheless, optical electronic integrated circuits and uh, photonic integrated circuits incorporating silicon and germanium have uh, been produced using silicon germanium detectors, modulators, and uh, multiplexes. However, we still need a silicon based light source. And just to give you a, a feeling for what is required here, we have a concept, this is from 15 years ago now, of how we could make everything we need to couple to optical fibers using silicon germanium. And pretty well everything there has been made, although uh, this particular one is still in the offing. That's the next generation coming up and pe people like Intel pursued this and made optical fiber couplers. You can, you can buy this chip. Uh, but these couplers are going into fibers or out of fibers. What I mentioned about copper wires still stands. We need it within the chip. That's the real issue. Oops, I went too far. So this uh, <coughs> slide summarizes the problems we have with materials. Here we have on the left a direct band gap material, which is gallium arsenide, with a schematic of the electronic band structure in the material. And normally uh, the electron resides in the valence band here. And <coughs> can be excited into the conduction band using uh, an electric current or light. And when it's in the conduction band, it falls naturally to the minimum here, which is at the zero wave vector, zero momentum, and then can recombine again with the hole below it, which is where it came from, emitting a photon at the band gap energy that's the band gap energy from there to there, between the two bands. And that process is very efficient. That's why we use three, five lasers at the present time in uh, optoelectronics. On the other hand, silicon and germanium both have indirect band gap. What that means is when the electron falls to the minimum in the conduction band, it's no longer at zero wave vector, it's at some value, uh, finite value in momentum space. And so when you conserve energy, when the, the, the electron falls back to the hole it came from, in this case you also have to conserve momentum because you're shifting from one place in K space to K equals zero, to a zero wave vector. And this means 
you have to have something that the photon interacts with to conserve the momentum. And in this case, in ultra pure <coughs> silicon or germanium, you need to, to interact with a phonon of the appropriate wave vector. Now this is not an easy thing to do. It's very inefficient and slow. This is not what we want to make a laser. So here's the optical emission from bulk silicon, clean bulk silicon at low temperature. And we see a, a series of sharp peaks emitted in the PL around the band gap of 1.15 EV. But the, the light that comes out at the band gap energy is very weak. It just is smudged in there because of impurities in the crystal. But we see in the phonons, this what they call the phonon replicas of that energy, which are shifted by the phonon energy to lower energy. And these are the momentum conserving transitions. And you'll see that this transverse optic mode is huge. It's way through the roof of this building. Imagine that. <laughs> this is a big building. <laughs> And uh, incidentally, I heard that this is the third largest hotel in the world, just to put it in perspective. <laughs> and this, uh, so this no phone on thing, which is what we want, is extremely weak. This doesn't make a laser. So how can we overcome this problem of this indirect band gap? And over the last few decades of three serious, uh, different serious approaches have been adop ad adopted and we have an expert in the audience here on the impurity side. Um, but the, the, the primarily it's called band gap engineering. That means we modify the energy levels of the structure so that the, the band gap becomes direct. And um, the other way is through adding impurities the more impurities, the better. And uh, the third way, which is the one I adopted, is quantum confinement. And this can occur in three different ways. In quantum wells, which is confinement in one direction. Quantum wires, which is confinement in two directions. And quantum dots, which is the confinement of carriers in three dimensions. And we'll do, I'll give you examples of all of those in this talk. I'm sorry for you behind me. No, I see perfectly well. You can see. <laughs> so that's the end of the introduction. Now we come to the science. This is our calculation for what happens to the transition energy, that band gap energy, as you make the object smaller and smaller and smaller. And remember the bulk gap was about 1.1 EV, which is that straight line along the bottom. We find, as you can see, that for a quantum well, confinement in one dimension, the band gap energy shoots up dramatically at a certain point. But the quantum dot, which has higher confinement because it's in three dimensions, shoots up even uh, faster. So that uh, is based on uh, effect of mass theory, but other people since then have used pseudo-potential methods and got similar results. So we know that these are not far out. The thing to notice though, and this is the most important thing, is look at the size of these objects. Here we are. It has to get below four nanometer in, in size before these effects are seen. Hey, can you go out and make a four nanometer object like that? Anybody here do it? No. <laughs> That's a tough problem. How do we get objects that small in regular patterns or arrays so that we can make use of them? Well, uh, that is one of the main challenges of, of this, this approach using quantum confinement. So uh, this was one way that was discovered by Lee Cannon and uh, reported in 1990. He showed that you could get bright photoluminescence from 
silicon uh, at room temperature, not even at low temperature as well, but at room temperature by electrochemical etching of oak silicon. Now, here, here's an electrochemical connection right away. <laughs> now you know why electrochemical society is needed for this work. And uh, the most importantly, he showed that this uh, quantum confinement would increase as he made the diameter of the particle smaller and smaller. So if anyone interested in getting light from silicon, that included me, jumped onto this uh, material right away and we had to learn. I spoke to electrochemists <laughs> that uh, could help us and uh, we learned how to make porous silicon. And eventually, um, I was able to show um, that the optical gap, which is obtained by optical absorption in this material, the way we made it, did indeed fit the expected theory for quantum dots. Here is our experimental data, and uh, this is the theory curve for quantum dots. And these particles I made were called by me ovoids, because in the TEM picture they are slightly oval. They're not uh, spherical. However, the PL from the same samples or similar samples here at a lower energy. Well, what's going on? And they had a, a quantum confinement effect as well, but much weaker. It was more like a wire than uh, a dot. What is going on there? So this uh, is the, the nub of the problem with porous silicon. It's a very complicated system. The surface chemistry is very complicated. And it took at least a decade and a half before uh, people found the reason for this decrease in PL energy. It was because the recombination was occurring at the surface of the silicon nanoparticles, not inside where the absorption occurs. And as a result, it was weaker, but it still showed confinement effects because it did depend on the surface area. So I gave up with porous silicon. <laughs> that was too tough. And we went then to quantum wells. Remember that first one was quantum dots. Now it's quantum wells. And these quantum wells, we crew with an MBE machine, which you'll see later in our laboratory, a molecular beam epitaxy, and a growth machine, an ultra-high vacuum. And we prepared a series of silicon, silicon dioxide super lattices by first growing a, a very thin layer of silicon on bulk silicon, then oxidizing it in a special way, which is the standard in the electronics industry, which always produces a one nanometer thick oxide layer, no matter what you do. It's never thicker, it's always the same. And then we will deposit another layer of silicon and do it again, and do it again, till we did six. Now, uh, you may wonder why we chose six. That was the half a day's work. <laughs> took you from morning to lunchtime to do one, one growth. So then, of course, we varied the silicon layer thickness to see what would happen to the PL. And the PL is bright. I should turn the room lights down, but you can, you can still see that glowing uh, red light coming out of this material. And that's at room temperature. Wow. Phenomenal. And by looking at, more, at it more carefully, we could, I don't show it in this view graph, but we could show it was band-to-band -band recombination by measuring the energy of the band gap. Uh, and also the PL uh, energy went up dramatically. Look how thick we can go down to, or thinner we can go down to. One nanometer thick samples. And that fitted theory beautifully. And the intensity does exactly what you expect. 
it starts off low, and as you get more confinement, it gets brighter and brighter. It would like to go all the way up there. But you have to remember it's getting thinner and thinner all the time. So when there's none there, it has to go to zero. <laughs> so it goes to a maximum and then comes down low again. So there's zero for the intensity. So by the time you've got back down to one, it's very weak. So clearly, there's an operating range where you want to be in around two nanometers for quantum wells. Now, I mentioned something right at the beginning, which anyone who works in MBE would see right away. It was grown at room temperature. I didn't emphasize that. But unfortunately, growing uh, <coughs> Uh, silicon at room temperature means it's not crystalline. We e examined its properties and it is different from normal amorphous silicon, which people know. It's, I call it disordered silicon, and I could give a talk just on that alone. But no matter what we did, we couldn't recrystallize that silicon. It just stayed there as it was up to 1200 degrees C. Wow. That's good for mass production. <laughs> it's very stable, but it, it wasn't exactly what we were looking for. So we did it again, this time finding a novel way to make crystalline silicon layers, very thin ones, but only one layer this time. And this was uh, using standard uh, industry CMOX wafers, silicon, oxi oops. silicon oxide, uh, too far. Silicon oxide grown by industry. This is industrial material with a silicon layer on top, which we etched down bit by bit until it became very thin. And you'll see we went down to 0.5 nanometers. That's one unit cell of silicon. And the intensity of that light was at room temperature, was phenomenal. And here we see in blue dots, the intensity of the PL of the quantum well as a function of layer thickness. And, it, and this time we didn't use effective mass theory, we used existing first principles calculations because they, they couldn't do the amorphous material, they could only do crystalline. And it's in very good agreement with two different calculations. But in addition, we got another PL we didn't want, and that comes fr from this interface. And it's fixed in energy no matter what the thickness is in this case. It's not quite the same as we found in porous silicon. <coughs> but nevertheless, it's light, visible, and at room temperature. So Professor Saito, who's in uh, Sussex University now, at that time in Hitachi Labs in Japan, showed that using our material, you could get stimulated emission from just one single quantum well. There it is. Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't produce a laser using this method, but it was a very heroic piece of work. So I hope to show you in this uh, next slide. This is the, we have to, we should, uh, you need a, some, usually there's a little thing that you get to make it work. Ah, oh, that's it, yeah. So just watch this quickly. I'm going to show it again because there's a lot happening here. But he made a distributed feedback structure using conventional CMOS technology. This is all based on CMOS. And built up this um, super lattice, if you like, of posts. And uh, then put in uh, some conduction band uh, connectors. And then here's our ultra-thin silicon quantum well. In this case, three nanometers thick. It's phenomenal. You see how sharp it is. And there it is, emitting a beam of light in the red, a light-emitting diode from one single quantum well. Unfortunately, up till now, it's not been a laser. 
but the proof of principle is there. You can do it, even if it's a heroic work, you can get there. So I'll just show you that again. Uh, how did we get that? Ah, that's, there's the cursor. Good, thanks. I'm, I'm so impressed with this. And I have to tell you, it's, it's phenomenal. You know, imagine all the steps in microfabrication that went on in producing the structure alone. Okay, so that's the quantum well, and uh, my friend Le Lorenzo Pavesi showed also that if you just took silicon nanocrystals within the silicon, surrounded by silicon dioxide in a uh, multi-layer structure, that you can also get <coughs> a stimulated emission. But again, it's not a laser yet. But that's in three-dimensional rather than a, a one-dimensional confinement system. Now this is going to take a while to load. It's a big photograph. It'll get there. So we decided it was time to look at quantum dots. <laughs> Back into quantum dots again. I hope it's going to load. This is a picture of our MBE machine. Uh, maybe we have to click it one more time. Could you go back and forth? Or maybe if, if I click it one more time, it'll come. Ah, no. there. I'm not used to this uh, way of uh, changing the view graphs. But anyway, here is Jean-Marc Barabot, our principal crystal grower, with a unique MBE machine which we bought to grow Gallium arsenide, remember, I said th three fives of what we need to get light, and we want to put it on silicon and germanium. So we could do uh, research on using gallium arsenide directly on silicon germanium. Unfortunately, we couldn't do, do anything useful with that. But the two machines were very useful independently. So we're using this machine, Jean-Marc, uh, Oh, it's a very, uh, we grew some various structures of three-dimensional self-organized quantum dots. That's shown here. First you start off with a substrate, you grow the first layer, the second layer, and you notice that this the quantum dot, it, it's a circle, if you look at it from on top, it's growing more and more well-defined, and nothing is growing here. So you have an isolated quantum dot of silicon germanium. And in this case, it was 40% germanium. And then we played a trick up here and changed things. And the reason we played a trick was that we found that the intensity of the PL emitted by these dots is much weaker and very dependent on the quality of the interface between the silicon and the silicon germanium. So this was a tailored structure, especially tailored, to give sharper interfaces on this top layer. This is the um, trick that we used. So this work was done by Leonard Sebeskov, uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And we'll see at low temperatures uh, a strong PL around 0.8 EV, ideal for optical fiber communications. And r astonishingly, we see this a very fast lifetime, 20 nanoseconds. Normally, it's milliseconds for, for a bulk a silicon. And here, when we penetrate uh, deeper into the subject and see these lower lying layers, we're getting two microseconds, which is pretty fast. But this is ultra fast. And we used six nanosecond pulse excitation Go back one. So the other thing that's important for device use 
is that this uh, shows a linear relation on the log log plot, not a saturation effect that's very common with silicon. So this for us is very encouraging to show that we can make structures that potentially will make lasers, but this is at room low temperature. We want room temperature. Here's another one looking at germanium dots with Isabelle Babesier in Marseille, France, and with the work on the infrared done by Nelson Rell at our laboratories. Here we look at dots of germanium that are self-assembled on a, a, a layer of silicon dioxide. When you heat the, if you put at low temperature a layer of silicon on top, by uh, MBE machine, it doesn't form a crystal. It's like happened with our silicon. But if you now heat it up, it turns out the germanium doesn't like being on silicon dioxide. It, it forms a, a de-wetting uh, layer. It bundles up into form flattened quantum dots. We then cover them, and here it is again. Wow, a big peak here. These are the phonon replicas I was telling you about. This is huge, a big peak due to light combining within those spheres. Uh, electrons, sorry, combining with holes within those spheres. And interestingly, you can take this line shape and deconvolute it on the log-log scale and see that we have a linear relationship between the dot diameter and the PL efficiency of those dots. That says that maybe we can do it with germanium. How am I doing for time? So then we looked at some nanowires produced by Isabel Babesier there in an array. She has a marvelous machine that can deposit these things in arrays. Here's an example here of those arrays. And again, we see, or in this case around uh, 1 MeV, a very strong PL band. But again, only at low temperature, unfortunately. So uh, I then turn to look at um, a way of generating a direct gap band gap by band gap engineering, as I mentioned earlier. This work was done uh, in theory at first. So we, got, we had, we had uh, some first principles calculations done by Alexander's group in Colorado. And he used uh, what, in solving this uh, tricky theoretical work, was a thing called a genetic algorithm. Does anyone here know what that is? No, <laughs> neither do I. <laughs> but that's what it, it's, it's something uh, special. Anyway, he played around with different models and then constructed superunit cells comprised of single layers or epitaxial layers of silicon and germanium grown on an alloy of a given composition. Could be anything you like. I'm sorry, I keep uh, touching the wrong button. So after a lot of playing around using this genetic algorithm, they found that there was this magic structure of silicon uh, germanium, 0.6 germanium, that you use as a base. And then you grow this very complicated unit cell. This is one unit cell, a monolayer of silicon, two monolayers of germanium, a monolayer of silicon, two monolayers of germanium, one layer of silicon, and then you put a capping layer of germanium on top. Poof! We would never have guessed that, or predicted that. And that's something extraordinary. And this is their band gap structure. I showed you the simplified one of silicon, crystalline silicon. This is for that one unit cell of silicon germanium. We see the direct band gap is at 863 MeV, ideal for uh, laser use and optical fibers. But look at all this messy band structure. Whoa. 
So he asked me if we could uh, check that out for him, and we managed to get Loa Leia's grown by Isabel Brevesier, and, uh, and two different ways, so I haven't got time to go into all of it, but when we did the PL at NRC, we saw to our dismay these huge peaks here below the expected band gap. But if you look down here, oops, I have to go back again. I keep pushing the wrong button. If you look here, there's a small peak. And if we blow that up, there it is. And that's curve fitted and we see indeed there is a small peak at uh, seven, at 874 in MEV, not quite the predicted energy of 863, but close enough. And we did this on two different samples made two different ways, and we looked at the temperature events, etc. So we're pretty confident now that that is the peak we're expecting. However, it's very weak, as you saw. That's not so good. And it, that's primarily because it's from one unit cell. We need to get this thing grown with 100 unit cells. Then it'll be 100 times more intense, but it, that's not an easy thing to do. And um, those intense peaks we now know are due to defects because the, you had to have this initial layer of silicon germanium that was a commercial product and it was full of dislocations, we found out. So, but in, in principle, we can have a direct band gap in silicon germanium now. I think that's possible. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about our most recent work, which was just published, um, but it's actually old work. People looking at silicon germanium alloys found this broad PL occurring, which for 20 years was unexplained. But we realized that it may be due to confined germanium clusters, self-assembled in the alloy layer. And this layer, alloy layer, is grown on silicon, and it's lattice matched in the plane. So this compression of the silicon germanium that way and that forces the silicon germanium to grow longer. So this is no longer a, a cube, it's a rectangle now, a rectangular structure. And this breaks all the selection rules. And when we fitted uh, this in detail, we found you know, that as we increased the composition of the alloy layer, the peak energy moved to lower energy. And this is the PL that you see in bulk germanium. It's much stronger and broader. <coughs> and if we plot all of those results versus uh, the uh, strain within the crystals, the germanium nanocrystals, the PL energy is very similar to those calculated by deformation potential model. That's the DP here and the tight binding model. But they're not exactly uh, in line with either of those, and that's an, another puzzle. But we know now that that is due to the fact that we're confining the carriers in the dots, the germanium nanocrystals. And there's in a confinement effect, we have to add on to that. And by doing that, we can then get agreement with theory. So. We're now getting strong light from a variety of silicon germanium na nanostructures, and definitely quantum confinement is, is a key factor. And I believe silicon germanium now is bright, it's shining, which it, it wasn't before. Um, the question is, is it bright enough? And we're at the point where we can make an LED, no trouble, and a laser is quite probable and that we believe the laser will come from using germanium dots. And uh, it won't be too long. <laughs> That's my prediction. So I want to thank my collaborators and my numerous other colleagues who have helped me in this work, both at NRC, at 
<coughs> and around the world. I also want to thank you for your attention and to the ECS for giving me this award. It's a great honor and I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs>